Dragon Age, the Veil Guard is almost upon us. I cannot wait. So excited. It's going to be a great month of November, everybody, as we dive in to the latest Dragon Age adventure. And today, there's an embargo coming down, and places like the official Xbox podcast have episodes for us to go watch and salivate over. So today, we're going to be reacting to the official Xbox podcast, Dragon Age, The Veil Guard Deep Dive. I've not watched this yet, but there are uh, official podcast episodes tend to be pretty entertaining. Um, we usually are talking with a creative director or two, and it looks like if we scan through, yep, that's what this is going to be. Uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, daily streams here and on Twitch, morning and evening. We do two a day. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here in the heart of Me EA, too. Electronic Arts, Redwood Shores, and... Let me tell you, I just got to play Dragon Age The Veil Guard, and I can't wait to talk about it with you two. Closest to me, John Epler, tell us what you do with uh, Dragon Age. Yeah, so I am the creative director for Dragon Age The Veil Guard, means that my focus is around lore, story, how we present the world, things like that. So. Just just a few things. Just a few things, one or two little things, yeah, yeah. And Corinne Bush, thanks yes. for joining us today. Thank you for having us. I'm uh, the game director. Uh, basically, I oversee the player experience, how everything's coming together, and generally just support the team making this wonderful experience they're so passionate about. It looks about. pretty awesome so far. So you've had a crazy summer from uh, announcing that the game is <laughs> called The Veil Guard in early June oh, to reviewing uh, a bunch of the companions to then showing off the first hour or so of mm -hmm. the game. And now you're here putting the game in people's hands. So like, like, what does it feel like to finally put the controller in the hand of creators and media? It's, it's a bizarre experience, but in a great way. Just being able to see people play this game that the teams work so hard on. I've been on the project for quite a long time, so it's just, it's a culmination of a lot of years of hard work and really building a Dragon Age that we're excited about, but also that we want our fans to be excited about, too. I think I think they are. I think a little bit, Just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> I'm yeah. super Team, excited. Are they excited now? Like, where are you at in the process? They are so excited. It's all um, polished this at this point. This is the part of the project that I think the team really cherishes because you get to see everything come together with clarity around everyone's contributions, how they're adding to that overall player experience. They're spending a lot of time playing the game, of course, appreciating each other's work. And I know they're so looking forward to fans and players being able to get hands on as well. And we're not that far away. So let, let's rewind just a little bit. I don't, somehow it was three months ago, uh, you and I sat in a room yeah. in downtown LA and uh, I jealously eyed you as you were, <laughs> had the controller in your hand and you played through and I, and I was giving you orders a little bit. Yeah, I, was, a little bit yeah. I was like, parry that, parry yeah. that. And you, you did, and you showed that. You I was did. like, great, because okay. I really wanted to see that. Um, but now that was a good I'm episode, getting to by see the way. how things feel like, like I had an idea of how things feel. And, and I will say, I, I think they feel great, but I would love to know from the team's perspective, what was the goal for movement, for just the overall moment-to-moment -moment feel of the game? I what think this you, is the build I'm like, going to end up going think with long-term. It's like this if rogue, Coming out of today, people wheeled. are saying that, and of course, when, when players get to do the same thing in October. Oh, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, A little bit of range. What I always refer to is the fluidity of it. We want this to be an immersive experience where you feel like you're in these massive cities where you're going toe to toe with these hordes of monsters. And to really feel like you're in that immersive experience, it meant feeling like every action you want to take, every impulse you have as a player, the game respects and reacts to that. I do want to give a huge shout out to the wonderful gameplay and animation team. That's really because cool. Because the work that's gone into animation branching, canceling, the intentionality behind it, the fluidity is, is something we're all quite proud of. Well, I think Corinne says something. When you mentioned intentionality, I think one of my favorite things cool about thing when you see it all come together. how the gameplay interacts with the art, interacts with the level design, interacts with the story. We want you to feel like Rook, like this character who's up against uh, bluntly un insurmountable odds and in that moment-to-moment -moment gameplay really getting you to feel we know how to deal with part tentacles of the action, by the way part of the experience <laughs> we talk a lot about storytelling not just as it applies to cutscenes and conversations but it, how the game feels like that is part of the story the actual actions of, of swinging a sword firing a bow should feel like you are rook in that moment and i think that's something i think the team has done an amazing job of really pulling together isn't it so wonderful when they'll share with us the anecdotes, these stories they're telling of their emergent gameplay, mm -hmm. of 
what it was, how they handled a challenge, how they dealt with some of these apex bosses in the game. Uh, frequently, there's cheering around the inventiveness of how people approach it. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel like uh, pointing to where you talked about how like it it's not just so the feel is. I liked where they like were showing off a conversation button, with but, Dev like, like mid journey the, how there. How the art and the animation and the sound even interacts. Mm -hmm. oh, um, so I, I, we, a couple of months ago, I was asking you to parry, and so I was like, I need to see. I mm -hmm. want to feel what the parrying feels like. And the, I will say the sound is a, a sound that you want to hear. It just it just feels good. And also just the, the feeling of impact. So at one point I was switched over to a two-handed weapon. I was using a, a Dwarven Warrior. <laughs> yep. And uh, you uh -oh. can feel the differences as well as just see that. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of the moves. I, I actually, uh, every time I play uh, an RPG and definitely Dragon Age, I've always been a rogue since Dragon Age 2. That's what I've done and, since the first and time. And I know I'm going to do that here mm -hmm. with the Veil Guard when I get to play the game myself. So I was like, let me try something different. And so I went with a, a, Dwarven, a Dwarven Warrior. And um, I think it may have won me over, which I did not expect. But there was a that's how the really druid cool was for me at Baldur's Gate Three. Which is the first, the first. I always play rogues in that one. I did druid. That it felt really cool and impactful. But then I also did not expect to get like Captain America vibes that, yeah. that you can throw your shield, and uh, yeah. I, I did love that. So I'm just curious. Obviously, I didn't get to see even a fraction of all the, the things that are available, different builds, and all those types of things. Do you have any favorite moves? Things you want people to keep an eye out for things that you're particularly proud of as these you things know, came together it's a hard it's a hard question to answer because i was telling i've told Chris before every time i play the game my favorite changes it's like all right i'm gonna play <laughs> this time i'm gonna play two-handed war oh man this is my favorite now okay this time i'm gonna play <laughs> dagger or a mage nope this is my favorite and i think each of them to me is what, what i love about them is they each speak to a very specific Ooh, that was nice class fantasy like they make you feel you know, well, Rogue is very agile and moves around the battlefield. A mage is, you know, doesn't take, maybe take us quite a many, much damage, but they're powerful. They're all about the big attacks and, uh, you know, using your da dagger or, or your staff in an effective way. So it's a hard question for me to answer, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, my actual favorites. Um, I, I think it's pretty well known that Rogue and the Veil Ranger specialization is my absolute favorite. That's kind of what I've been but leaning I will towards. Say, the mage spell blade is not far behind. And in fact, uh, if if I were to tell you my all-time favorite move, in spell blade, you can unlock some traits where you take that orb, you're able to combo it into this massive swirling AOE. I'll tell you, when you go up against a dragon and you just clock that guy right in the face a couple of times with this AOE, nothing feels like it. So, Corinne, you've, you've mentioned combos, you've mentioned uh, move ca animation canceling. I love the combos and, 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 and Mass animations. Effect. These are things that I, I'm used to hearing, like maybe it, when we're talking about a fighting game. or um, And and so it's it's been a decade since Dragon Age Inquisition, and a lot has changed in that time. Like The Witcher 3 came out in that time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Elden Ring came out in the time. I, I, what people think about with an, a, an action RPG has evolved tremendously mm -hmm. in the last decade. So how are you thinking about what goes into a modern, quote unquote, modern RPG versus the expectations of Dragon Age fans who have been with you uh, for, you know, more than 15 years? Yeah, well, first and foremost, autonomy, player autonomy, giving you that choice in how you want to jump into this world, how you want to experience it, what your gameplay loop feels like. The choices are pretty spectacular. Some of this looks a uh, lot like Baldur's Gate 3 to me, which is a good thing. Like that that allows you uh, to just, I'm looking at this going, I am going to get so immersed. And uh, hopefully along the way, you get some gear that maybe tempts you to try out a different build. That's certainly the foundation of it. We also know we're in the midst of an RPG renaissance, mm -hmm. and the bar has really been raised mm -hmm. in terms of responsiveness, fidelity, that sense of control. And... Um, yeah, I think we're, we're quite proud of what the team has done to deliver that really fluid take on the Dragon Age formula. I, I felt it. I, I hope everyone else feels it too. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely. Um, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about some gameplay that I saw. So last night as I was on my, my way down here, I saw the IGN first. Uh, yes. So you, both of you were with Cat mm -hmm. Bailey. It's about 22 minutes of footage that I had never seen before. And one of the things that jumped out at me, Corinne, and I'm not calling you out here. But <laughs> here we go. 
But I'm calling you out. Uh, but you were on like a f the final sliver of your health like multiple times uh, to the point where it's like, oh, there must be a mode set where they're invincible. But then, no, actually, uh, it, it, that's how it ended. Again, that's not, the, my point is not that. My point is, <laughs> is um, this game, or at least that part, looked hard. And and, I, and I'll be honest, I, like, I, I play a ton of RPGs and a lot of them, I might see a game over screen yeah. Once, you know, if that, if, if I'm careless or something like that, clearly that doesn't seem to be the case here. Is there a conscious, um, well, you know, effort there's to make sure that there is sliders. challenge there? I don't know if that's maybe oh. just even that evolution of, of where RPGs are going these days. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we spoke of that RPG renaissance. And one of the trends that have come of this is an increased focus on challenge, tactics, strategy. So really you feel like you have a mastery of the game. It is quite challenging. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned that anecdote. If I may share, uh, for the longest time, my, my good friend John Epler here uh, died in front of the entire team. <laughs> and for a year, we didn't live it down, but now, Corinne gets to die in front of the whole. World. I finally have. I finally have an ability to one up Corinne because yeah, it was it was it's still a thing. But I think what but what Corinne's saying I think about challenges, especially allowing you to making sure that you have that ability and that honestly that incentive to use your whole toolkit because there's so much you can do in this game. Yeah. So many ways you can approach gameplay that we want to make sure that for players who do have that like I'm I'm a kind of player who loves challenge, you know Elden Ring things like that. I love the ability to go in and make the game feel a lot more challenging, but at the same time also allowing other players to customize their experience. That's such a good point. That's Our difficult, these sliders. so it's diverse awesome. in their motivations, their expectations. And I'm with you, John. I I'm a big love story a good mode Souls fan. Like. Uh, I like to play on the hardest difficulties mm -hmm. of our game. And uh, it is really tuned around that element of when you survive, it's often by just a hair's breadth. And... Um, the exhilaration that comes from that. But if you're that player that maybe you're mostly here for the story, Hi, or maybe you're me. here for exploration, any number of motivations, I love how deeply customizable our difficulty options is. From, from the various presets we have, which are all valid ways to play, uh, and then if you want to create your own custom difficulty. I've noticed that. Yeah. So you mentioned exploration, and in the area that I've played so far this morning, very focused, early in the game, expected. In that IGN first, I noticed, getting a lot of shout outs to IGN, but we love them. Cat uh, <laughs> Bailey's great. So um, <laughs> you were you were in an area. It also means um, they're doing their job with the IGN first the series, because we've all been watching them. there was them. A, more areas all for exploration them. or opportunities. Can you talk about how you're balancing exploration versus, okay, we don't want to like, necessarily overwhelmed with like a million different things and you're you know completely yeah. lose the plot Maybe when the world's ending jump in on the gameplay loop and then john if you want to go into the the creative and narrative mm. there um so again i mentioned autonomy earlier uh we sincerely believe that autonomy player agency is what really uh captures the imagination of the rpg fan so we knew with exploration, though we are a very handcrafted, it looks beautiful, guys. Game, exploration. Is I a think I'm gonna play this on it. the Series X. You mentioned Crossroads. It's one of my favorite areas mm. in the game, not only because you're using it to functionally travel to all corners of Northern Thetis, but the mysteries within. Um, it's optional content, but I, I almost hesitate to call it that mm -hmm. because these stories... Well, for people who want to dive in, it's not optional. People like me, rebellion. it's completionist stuff. Some of the bosses you're going to fight, my goodness, we if don't you're skip looking that for in challenge, our RPGs. you're going to discover them there. But it's going to make you work for it. Um, I love 100%ing each of these larger exploration areas. And look, if you're that kind of player, you're you're going to be in for the long haul. Nice. And I think the other side of it for me is it gives players an opportunity because there are some very heavy story beats that you're going to run into. And sometimes you don't want to be doing like five of those in a row. And like, well, I feel the most depressed I've ever been. So. <laughs> but it gives you that opportunity of like, okay, I'm going to do some heavy story stuff. Now I want to do some exploration. Even in those exploration spaces, the, the side content you can come across is story focused. It has a narrative. It just may not be necessarily tied to a specific character arc you're doing or something like that. Right. So for me, the kind of player I am is I do bunch of story in a row and then I just go off and explore and I spend a bunch of time mm. in the crossroads and our other exploration spaces and I love that you can kind of carry your agency experience man. with 
content that is itself curated to be really focused around what's the theme of the space, what's the theme of this character. Um, so a lesson we learned from DAI, and I mean, everyone remembers the hinterlands, <laughs> making sure that that content felt narratively relevant, even if it's not directly contributing to the critical path of the game, it's contributing to the story of these spaces because each of these spaces, we're very careful in putting you in places that have this deep narrative in them, this story that, again, it runs parallel but not disconnected from the story of the fight against the Elven Gods. But it's more fun than just like collect eight exactly. Yeah, let, let me be clear. We did not want to go the fetch quest route. <laughs> so um, Nobody does. Everything. Our goal is to make it narratively rich and tie back, as John said, to the areas and the overall narrative. And I, I will say one of my favorite loops, when we talk about, say, the crossroads or Hosberg wetlands, we talk about the exploration loops and opportunity within those spaces, mm -hmm. but they're so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite loops is discovering these secret areas There's in the chest. crossroads that are going to require you to go out into other exploration they just areas She just yeeted them off the cliff. That was awesome. And really awesome. track down these elements you need, solve these mysteries to come full circle, bring it back, and discover entirely new aspects of these zones. Very good, very good, thank Great answer, uh, I love that. Quick commercial break, everyone, to celebrate and give thanks to all of these amazing people who keep me on the air full time. Really appreciate the support. All you gotta do is join as a member, you get access to private videos. You can also do super thanks on any upload or super chats and stickers on any live stream or premiere you see. And beyond that, don't forget we're multi-streaming over on Twitch now, so you can support over there as well. Thanks so much to everybody. Let's get back to the video at hand. Um. One other thing that I saw last night, again, last time we'll reference this IGN first, but there was a lot in there, was the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, seems like a base area, but it, you, I, it seemed like there was conversation that it will change over time. I, I'd love to, if you could just share more on that. Yeah, so the lighthouse is Solus's old, old base of operations. And one of the things we really wanted to make it feel like is there's, it's a character in its own right in a way, in that it evolves and it reacts to the people that are coming into. In this case, you're recruiting members of the Veil Guard. They're showing up. And these spaces that were, when Pillars you first of Eternity show up at the beginning of the game, good with dusty your, and empty, become full of that character's personality. And you'll actually see the evolution of the space over time. But again, we wanted to make sure that, you know, in Dragon Age Inquisition, we had Skyhold. It was a huge space. We wanted to make sure that there was a focus. And I think focus is a word that we're going to use a lot, but it's a it's about these characters, it's about their stories, and it's also about learning who Solus was before the events of the Veil Guard. It's very intimate in yes. that regard, isn't it? Um, you know, it's been it's interesting beautiful. following the discourse online. We, we released a couple of screenshots of the various companions' rooms within the lighthouse. Yeah. Oh, those and, are great uh, I've been loving the speculation. The I'm absolutely here for it. What's interesting is as the companions grow and the world of Thetis evolves, how that's reflected in the lighthouse, you'll see more and more God. of those companions' character come out in their surroundings. So um, one last question here. This is our first time getting hands on. Uh, there's lots of people here and you're letting us capture lots and lots uh -huh. of, of video. And so uh, the, the, the internet's gonna be flooded with Dragon Age, the Veil Guard stuff uh, <laughs> over the, the course of the next, you know, several weeks. What do you think people thing. notice and take away the most? Whether it's labor of love details, whether it's a, a topic that maybe hasn't been discussed as much as you think deserves. I, I would yeah. love to hear about that from you. There's so many ways we could answer this question. I think the um, the biggest one for me, the one that resonates the most with me personally, is that this is a game where you can see yourself in the characters, in how you role play Rook. This is a game where everyone is welcome to live out their own version of this story. Well, we've always and, seen that, um, and that's that's why I play a RPGs. To, uh, to see the reactions from fans. I love going um, into that even within character. within the dev team. It's great. To see the appreciation of, you know, I can really see myself in this. And I think for me, it's kind of it kind of touches on what you said earlier. It's about the, the amount of love that's been poured into all these details by the team and how they all connect together. And they feel, again, like a really cohesive experience. It's a Dragon Age game. And I mean, I've been on all the previous Dragon Age games, it feels, seeing how much this feels like Dragon Age 10 years later is kind of what I'm hoping people pull out of this is. It's just, 
you get into it, and the moment you start, you see Solus like, yep, this is Dragon Age. This is 100% yep. Dragon Age. I'll tell you the, uh, the thing I'm most excited about once players have it in their hands is just hearing about the choices they've made, mm -hmm. uh, the adventures they've gone on, who they romanced, of course. Of course. Um, those are the stories Nev. that it's make be Nev. First Dragon time. Age and why people <laughs> still talk about Dragon Age Inquisition 10 years later. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me, honestly, you are talking about once they have it in their hands, it's all the an all answers to questions that they've had for years. And, and then also, because it's Dragon Age, brand new questions <laughs> that they can now find, try to find the answers to. So it would be fun if you answered everything. Exactly. All right. Uh, before we wrap up here, I'd love for you to look directly at the camera. <laughs> Dragon Age The Veil Guard's coming out October 31st. What do you say to the children who are not going to be allowed to go trick-or-treat because their parents are going to say, I'm sorry, mommy and daddy are staying home and playing this game. You can hand out candy to everybody else. <laughs> My goodness. I, I would say, look, kiddos, you get Halloween every other year. Let the parents have one. <laughs> and I'll say life hack. That's Halloween true. candy is on sale the day after Halloween, and you can gorge yourself on that. So <laughs> appreciating the, the value. These are lessons exactly. learned. They gotta learn life eventually. Lessons. Corinne, John, thank you so much. Wishing you the best of luck as we lead into that final stretch of launch for Dragon Age the Veil Guard. But thanks for taking time to visit us here on the Xbox Podcast. Thanks for having us. It was awesome. It's been such a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, cool, everybody. That brings us to the end of this episode. I cannot wait for Dragon Age the Veil Guard. I hope you are also ready. There's going to be a ton of information coming out in the next few days uh, after everybody's come back and the embargo's coming down. Um, like the rest of you, I'm going to be watching as many videos as I can, and I will be posting reactions here to them and having further discussions as we continue our march to October 31st. But I am a variety player, streamer, content creator, and I play a lot of different games, so hopefully we'll see you in the next episode. I stream every single day on YouTube and Twitch in the mornings and in the afternoons, 9 a.m. Mountain Time in the mornings and 4 or 5 p.m. in the afternoons, so we'll see you there. Don't forget all the socials, Discord, Patreon. Check the links below for more Dragon Age stuff. See you next time, everybody.